Good evening. It is Thursday, December 3rd. Welcome to News at Night. I'm Colette Linden. And I'm Daniel LaPrade. I'll have your full weather forecast details coming up later on, including your regional temperatures and what we can expect for this weekend in terms of sunshine, coming up later on in the newscast. The Ontario government is investing nearly $4.4 million to support the long-term sustainability of the province's vital tourism industry. This funding will help deliver innovative, safe experiences like virtual festivals and events and support tourism operators as they deal with the impacts of COVID-19. Lisa McLeod, Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries, was at Stacked Market in Toronto today to announce the first recipients of the new Reconnect Festival and Event Program and the Tourism, Economic Development and Recovery Fund. Through the Reconnect Festival and Event Program, Ontario is investing more than $3.4 million to support 27 local events and initiatives. These events are the first to be approved through the program, which was launched in October 2020. This funding will support festival and event organizers as they adapt to new public health measures with virtual drive through and other safe offerings. The Ontario government is also investing more than $912,000 in 14 initiatives initiatives through the Tourism, Economic, Develop and Recovery Fund. The $1.5 million fund is an application-based cost-sharing program designed to provide funding for projects that encourage the development of innovative new tourism products, support tourism investment, or build the capacity of Ontario's tourism industry. Applications are being accepted on an ongoing basis. The recladding project at City Hall will not be finished for another six months and even more over budget. $1.3 million is the growing total of cost overruns for the project. It was put on the consent agenda at Monday night's council meeting. The consent agenda is an addendum to the agenda where all council members have a chance to comment on but in the end gets passed. Councillors commented on many things on this agenda such as Algoma University City Studio Program, sidewalks and a fire service bylaw. However, no additional comments to the over runs were made. The total cost is now estimated to be $8.2 million. The original bid was 6.9. The council continues to get updates on this project and the new projected completion date is May to June of 2021. A very real and extremely long-standing frustration between Northern Ontario and Queen's Park over developing policies and program begs the question, do we need a Northern Lens? Northern Policy Institute's latest commentary, Does Ontario Need a Northern Lens? by Heather Hall, dives into the possibilities and lessons around the creation and implementation of a Northern Policy Lens. A policy lens is a tool that is used to develop or review existing policies, programs and government practices based on a particular theme. Within this framework, a rural lens is used to review all new and existing policies to ensure that urban and rural residents receive equitable treatment. The commentary explores international and domestic examples of northern and rural lenses and how they operate once implemented in Northern Ireland, England and Canada. Using the takeaway lessons gathered from these cases, several key considerations were noted should Ontario were to implement a northern lens, what works in the south simply does not always apply to the north. On December the 2nd, officers with patrol services arrested 36-year-old Tashia Farrell for using a stolen credit card. It is alleged on November 23, 2020, the accused stole a purse from a vehicle and it contained bank cards. It is further alleged the accused used the stolen bank cards to make 10 separate purchases, totaling approximately $590 at a number of local businesses. All of the purchases were made on November the 23rd. On December 2nd, officers observed the accused walk in the area of Albert Street East and was arrested. She is charged with 10 counts of using a stolen credit card and two counts of theft of a credit card. She is scheduled to appear in court on January the 11th, 2021. Algoma Public Health has confirmed the 61st COVID-19 case in the Algoma region. Citing international travel as the exposure category, APH noted in a release that the person was tested on Tuesday and is currently self-isolating. Of the 61 cases confirmed in the region thus far, three remain active in Algoma. I'll have your evening temperatures coming up as well as your regional forecast and what we can expect this weekend coming up after this break. Stay tuned, you're watching News at Night. COVID-19 is a serious public health threat. All Canadians must act now to reduce the spread. 
Avoid crowded places and practice social distancing. Avoid non-essential travel and stay home as much as possible. Self-isolate if you may have been exposed to COVID-19. Stay connected with neighbors, friends and family. When you take care of yourself, you take care of others. A message from the Government of Canada. Welcome back to News at Night on Thursday, December 3rd. Hope everybody has enjoyed their day. We did have some snowfall overnight last night and a little bit into the afternoon today. That's going to continue on and off for the next little while too. And we may see another trace, a centimeter or two of snow, but no major accumulation is expected. And I do have good news. Your weekend is looking pretty good. What's coming up? So let's take a look right now at the satellite and see what we got for cloud cover here. So we don't have a whole lot. Uh, we, we do have a bit of cloud cover that's moving in our area and if you go north there is quite a bit of cloud cover here up towards Wawa and then as we get into Thunder Bay area but in Sault Ste. Marie we are going to eventually clear out here slowly however we are going to see some lingering flurries scattered flurries throughout the night and then that will continue into tomorrow so let's get into and winds are going to be a little bit of a factor but I'll have those details here in a few so let's take a look outside at what it looked like today with the snow this is wirelesscom.ca who sponsors our cameras. So as you can see, the camera's even shaking a little bit from the wind, but we did get a bit of snowfall. The roads were a bit slick in the morning, but things have cleared out and we will see that continue. You won't have to worry about, you know, you won't have to really worry about the roads at this point, but in the morning, just be wary that you may have to brush off your car again, start giving yourself time. I know we've been spoiled, so we got to give ourselves a few extra minutes so you're not rushing. Okay, so our lows for the overnight for our region, we're looking at minus four in Thunder Bay, minus five in Wawa. You're down to minus seven in Timmins, the cool spot, only hitting minus two here in Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury, or sorry, Sault Ste. Marie and Elliott Lake, and then minus one in Sudbury. So not too bad of a night coming up. Uh, for us here, we are gonna see cloudy. We do have that 30% chance of a flurry late in the evening. And after midnight, as I mentioned, a lingering flurry, uh, there is another two centimeters possible. Winds will become northwest overnight, 30 kilometers, so it is still going to be breezy. We'll be blowing things around, and we will see that continue into the morning. Now, as we get into your Friday, we're looking at those flurries ending in the morning, then cloudy, local amount of, again, 2 centimeters possible. Winds will be northwest, 30 kilometers, gusting to 50, so another breezy day. We're looking at a high of 1 degree. However, the temperature is going to fall quick. As we get into the afternoon, it's going to go to minus 4, and the wind chill is going to be minus 11. So and it's going to really cool down tomorrow afternoon, and as you can see, we're going to see minus 6 overnight on Friday with cloudy periods. So things are going to freeze up. Anything that's slushy during the day on Friday that's still around, it will freeze up. So do keep that in mind. It will be icy on Saturday morning. Okay, minus one is your high on Saturday. You're looking at mainly sunny, not a whole lot going on in the form of precipitation. Going to be a nice day. A low of minus seven on Saturday night with a few clouds. Sunday is looking all right too. We're at the freezing mark, mix of sun and cloud. Cloudy periods overnight with a low of minus five. Not much to report there. And as we get right into your work week, it continues. We're looking at a mix of sun and cloud for another couple days. We'll get up to four by Wednesday and then we'll see some clouds and overcast before the sun's back on Thursday and right there we're still at this point we're still above zero however next weekend is when we could see our first blast of snow with significant accumulation so at this point it's looking at next weekend uh, we are seeing lows between minus three to seven there on the board and then we get up to the freezing mark again for a couple of nights next week early in the week so we're not doing too bad. And as we approach our shortest days of the year, your sunrise is 8.03 Eastern and your sunset was at 4.51 Eastern time. So we are getting closer to those days where we're going to be in the dark not too long after 4. Okay, so this is our weather watcher photo from Judy Rosewell. And this is from Corner Brook, Newfoundland and Labrador. And beautiful shot with the colors there. I've been to Newfoundland quite a few times now and it is beautiful. Um, and Corner Brook is a very nice city. So thank you very much for sending that in, Judy. If you have any other photos, uh, weather photos or videos related, please send them in to ontvweather at gmail.com. Include your name and location. They will go up on the show as well as on the newscast here and on sueonline.com. 
and it gets featured on our social media so everybody gets to see your beautiful photos so make sure you send them in and while you're on the site go to see the holiday pick of the day it's pinned on our facebook page and you can actually win some stuff with contests so chris is getting all these holiday picks and i'm not getting any weather picks anymore because it's the holidays so please send in your weather photos so we have some weather photos and holiday picks as well so that's what's going on so colette will be back after the break with more local news stay tuned have a great night week on TV reported on a story involving a one-year-old boy who had died in the back seat of his father's vehicle after officers opened fire on the man after his pickup truck crashed into a cruiser injuring an officer who was laying down a spike belt. The special investigations unit says the 33-year-old man died in a hospital on Wednesday night. It says the man was injured and his baby was found dead of a gunshot wound in the back seat of his pickup truck. Police had been investigating an alleged kidnapping at the time. In addition to the three police issued guns, the S SIU says investigators found a fourth firearm at the scene. Government officials say at least 22 boil water advisories in First Nation communities will remain in place after March 2021, the deadline to deliver on a promise to lift all long-term advisories made by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau five years ago. The department says 97 boil water advisories have been lifted since 2016, which still leaves 59 in place for 41 communities as the problem of unreliable drinking water persists. Christine Fox, the Deputy Minister of Indigenous Services, says the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown a wrench into efforts to upgrade water systems and carry out on-site training, with supply chains snarled and some reserves opting to restrict travel. Meanwhile, Naskintaga has the longest duration boil water advisory of any reserve in the country, 25 years and counting. In its fall economic statement Monday, the Liberal government pledged to invest $1.5 billion this year to work toward lifting all long-term drinking water advisories in Indigenous communities, on top of $2.1 billion already committed since 2016. The mining industry in Canada has evolved over the years and continues to do so with an emphasis on health and safety. Keeping that in mind, a tech company in Sudbury has recently developed what is calling a smart helmet that features more than just your traditional headlamp. Ray Boucher, the vice president of Danatech Industries, says these helmets are different. They come with cameras and phone capabilities. In addition to the new doodads and whatnots on the helmets, the company also developed a way to enable contact tracing for miners during COVID-19. They use an existing technology called ranging, which was already used in their helmet, initially created to track the distance between miners. Information can be extracted and sent to a database offering information as someone has been diagnosed. Lights around the bottom of the helmets, Boucher explained, turn on as soon as two workers are within a certain distance to alert the workers that they are too close to each other. Helmets start at $99 but become more expensive as you add on various capabilities capabilities. Right now, the company has its first 500 smart helmets in production, which are being made for a mining company on the East Coast. On TV show Between the Lines with Dan Gray will be hosting Santa Claus in an upcoming episode. The show will feature local children being able to speak with Santa Claus virtually from the North Pole. Santa is extremely excited to be able to join the children of Sault Ste. Marie. More details will be available soon. Thank you for watching News at Night. I'm Colette Linden. And I'm Daniel LaPrade. Join us for more news and weather after this.